<laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, some of you have asked uh, last week uh, that uh, the video is not up on YouTube of the last class I gave, and that's because we had some technical difficulties, and I have to we have to do a reshoot of the introduction uh, because it got kind of lapsed off the last one. So once that's done, it'll go up. Uh, some other things uh, to remind you is Curtis and I sent out some uh, rules or guidelines for helping him. Uh, basically, make sure you have your name. If you ask a question, turn your video on, uh, dress appropriately, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's pretty much given. Those are those are the house rules he'd like to give. Now, I've had some other people give me some feedback on, hey, six o'clock's a little early for me. Do you mind if I come in late? Of course, I don't mind if you come to my class a little late. It's not a problem. You know, these are these are challenging times for everyone. So, so I just want to make it uh, amenable to everybody. You know, who wants to come and check out the class? And if not, you can always catch it later on YouTube. So, I want to make a couple things to, just to give some people some background. You know, I met Suzuki Sensei in uh, 1997, and he was 80 years old at the time. At the same time, I met Curtis Sensei, who was 53 years old at the time. So when I first met Suzuki Sensei in Arizona, you know, Curtis Sensei was the Otomo. He was, he was just the guy that kind of sat over in the corner while everyone else was hanging out with Suzuki Sensei, you know, listening to his stories and that kind of thing. And, and that brings me to a point there, you know, a few years ago, it was not few, but you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, there was a person, Curtis Sensei, I think was reading an interview of somebody and it kind of talked about somebody referring to Suzuki Sensei as their teacher. And Curtis Sensei was quite clear this guy really wasn't a student of Suzuki Sensei. He went to a few seminars, he trained with him a little bit, but he wasn't considered so-called his teacher. So, and that kind of brings me to a point that a lot of us, you know, when we go to seminars, you see all the good. It's, it's the shiny new toy. It's really interesting to see that teacher, their perspective, how they do things. And a lot of times people come away, you know, every, every year, you know, Hawaii Federation would invite uh, a, an instructor, whether it be Shane or Sensei, Kashiwa Sensei, uh, to come give a seminar. And I know a lot of times they would teach something and then they would go to Curtis Sensei and go, oh my God, you're not gonna believe this. And he's like, yes, I've been teaching that for the last 20 years. But it's just that you heard it in a different light and it clicked for you. So, so a lot of times going outside, getting some instruction is always good. But a relationship you build with your teacher, whoever that may be, uh, is quite different. I like to refer to it as a lot of, I knew Suzuki Sensei as seminar Suzuki Sensei. You know, he was 80 years old. He wasn't as scary as he was with Curtis Sensei. And, you know, when Curtis Sensei arrived at the dojo in 1974 and he chased him into the corner with a bokan screaming at him, this is Shinken Shobu. Um, I did not know that Suzuki Sensei. I knew Suzuki Sensei as a really great guy. I mean, he still was serious on the mat, but off the mat, he was really pleasant to get along with, really loving. And I think Melly Stokesbury uh, stressed that last week. That's the Suzuki Sensei a lot of us knew. Not the same instructor Curtis Sensei knew. So there's a lot to be had there. I just, I just wanted to kind of clarify that, just because a lot of people you, people you know, have never been around Suzuki Sensei. My experience with Suzuki Sensei is much different than Curtis Sensei's. Uh, just as my relationship with Curtis Sensei is, is pretty unique in a lot of ways. Um, with that being said, Curtis Sensei, you know, reminded me um, that in his book, Letting Go, also 
talks about etiquette. And I'll read you a passage. Now, this is from page 20 of the hardback. Or if you have the ebook, it's page 27. And I quote, I talk about this, about the levels of our responsibility to ourselves and to others in the dojo and in the work that we're doing. This can be simply stated as etiquette. It, it could be a good idea to go back through the chapter on etiquette in the book Ki Aikido on Maui, the training manual, and maybe just reread it. Maybe not just once, but maybe every several months. Just go back and read it again. You want to constantly remind yourself because it helps to keep you grateful. It reminds you that this is a privilege. And when we're acting with appropriate etiquette in the dojo, in other words, not letting our limited animal nature run things, when we're acting with maturity, then we are demonstrating to the universe our level of responsibility and our recognition and appreciation of this privilege we are given. I just wanted to start that off this class with that statement from letting go and and also give you a hint you know as we go through not just this class but curtis sensei's class on friday you might want to just dust off the copy of letting go because all the topics even you know the four principles that suzuki sensei quotes they're in there and and i say that because if you go in there and reread it you might find oh either A, I don't understand that, or B, I wonder what he means by that, or C, I'd like to him to expound a little bit further on that topic of what he wrote in Letting Go or the training manual or on his website. Uh, those are all primers, you know, to help you guys ask questions uh, on Friday's class. And I just encourage that. Now, I was heavily involved in the book Letting Go just because he, he he didn't just write that book. That book came about from his lectures. And I used to, you know, listen to every lecture and put it up on his website. And it's not a book you probably like to pick up and read cover to cover. Um, I personally could not read that book cover to cover. But what I recommend, and, and I say this uh, to a lot of my students in Maui, is, you know, use the book as a reference manual. Take a chapter, pick out the chapter, read the chapter and go, oh, yeah, as a reminder, as a refresher. Maybe it's before your class that you're going to teach or attend. Maybe it's before a seminar. You know, those things, you know, just these tools are there for you to use and they're actually pretty darn good you know like i said last week you know suzuki sensei used to tell us back when back in the day back in the day there was no videos there was no books there was just toy sensei coming to maui and and doing his thing so so we have a lot of things to go with go through and and i encourage you guys to do that so getting back to to etiquette you know, I kind of looked at the next section of etiquette uh, entitled On the Mat, um, specifically topics number four, five, seven, 10, and 12. And they're pretty much all the same thing, but I'll read a few of these to you and we can start, you know, having a little discussion about them. Um, number four, On the Mat, never interrupt the class to question unnecessarily. If you must ask a question, wait until an appropriate morning, uh, moment. So, you know, that's that's coming through just to tact. You know, timing is everything and knowing when to ask a question and when not to ask a question is really important because trust me, I've learned that mistake many times because I was the one who was always in class raising my hand going, yeah, but sensei, uh, isn't it done quite like this? Or, or did they change that? Don't do that. I made that mistake many times. In fact, I pretty much don't talk in class right now. I just shut up because otherwise crows are flying in my mouth all the time. So, 
you know, we talk about asking questions and the time to ask a question, of course, is when Sensei says, do you have any questions? <laughs> Probably before that, if you want to take him off to the side and ask a question, yeah, yeah, that's okay too. You know, he doesn't encourage that, but I often do that, you know, on the side, I'll ask him a question, mainly because I'm embarrassed to look stupid. Uh, so, I mean, I encourage people to just ask questions, but not in the middle of a demonstration, like when he's showing something in class. And, and that kind of goes through to number five, which do not call out or interrupt the sensei while he or she is teaching. Again, you know, that's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate sometimes that we have to describe these kinds of etiquette, but, you know, fortunate in the sense that, that they're written down and we can, we can go over them and kind of discuss them. But, you know, if think about, and this kind of goes back to having a conversation with somebody when you're having a conversation a think are you actually listening to the person or are you forming in your mind i'm going to rebut that statement or whatever with this or i'm thinking how to a get my opinion across you know are you actually listening so when you're when you're uh, reading that, don't interrupt the sensei, that's because he's not finished, you know, talking or demonstrating, either one. So when you're talking to somebody, you don't go, oh, oh, excuse me, I'd like to say something right here. No, you should listen to everything they have to say, you know, as, as Curtis Sensei would always describe, you know, uh, his discussion or class he took with Toy Sensei, listen like you're one big ear, you know, just listen don't think about anything else but listening you know uh that's you know from taking you know a point that's etiquette that's standard practice at most dojos and into you know your business relationship your work relationships your relationship with your friends uh relatives and significant others you know don't interrupt listen that's the best advice you can get from most uh uh instructors and you know suzuki sensei I, I have to tell the story real quick <laughs> so suzuki sensei was uh was in the office and <clears throat> he had hearing aids so if he put the phone up to his hearing aid it would whistle really super loud sometimes so he would often take his hearing aids out you know and then he couldn't hear anything so he was always either putting his hearing aids in or taking them out and he didn't like them. But one time, you know, phone rings, picks up the phone and it's his, his wife, Patsy, and she starts talking and she's talking super loud on the, on the phone. And he's just like, yep, 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 yep. Okay, click. Didn't say one thing other than yes, yes, okay. I said, oh, sensei. Uh, do you need something? Do you need to go home? Does Patsy need something? Nope. She was just telling me what she was making for dinner. <laughs> I had to laugh because he didn't, he didn't counter with, oh, could you make this instead? Or, oh, I would like this. He didn't give any opinion on what he wanted. He was super, just super grateful for what his wife was going to make him, you know, and, and he listened. That's it. And, and I often go back to the story because I just find it just so, he was just like that all the time. You know, he, he was the same person day in, day out. There was nothing, you know, uh, surprising. He, he was just, you know, some may say boring, but he was so full of life that, you know, people just love to hang out with him. Uh, that's my quick story. So moving on to number number seven, uh, there should never be conversation of any kind while a sensei is demonstrating when training with your partner. Speak only as absolutely necessary. I find this quite interesting because it's, it's you know, even in the, you know, the Zoom rules, you know, Curtis Sensei kind of said, hey, don't have any side conversations while things are going on in the chat. You know, that'd just be like if you're in class whispering to your partner oh yeah 
and and this is so funny because it it brings me back to how I first tried to learn Aikido and I had started Aikido at a community college in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And I was with my buddy. I talked to my buddy into to attending a class with me. And of course, in the beginning, when you get a bunch of white belts that come to any introductory class or anything, they just want to work with each other. They don't ever want to change partners because they don't want to feel uncomfortable or stupid. Hence, I was like that. So I told my buddy, I said, okay, this is how we're going to learn this. We're going to crack this code. It's going to be super easy. You watch what he does with his feet and I'll watch what he does from the waist up. We'll pair up and we'll knock this technique out like it's nothing. And my friend goes, yeah, 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 let's do it. So we were doing it. He was, I said, okay, the footwork's like this and this, and we were just going through techniques left and right. We're catching on really fast. And then, of course, we had the dreaded change partners happen. So I'm thinking, of course, everyone knows this technique of learning. So I first pair up with who I did not know at the time, but now is a very good friend of mine. Her name was Mayumi Case, who has a dojo in Raleigh, North Carolina, under Shainer Sensei. Her and I uh, grew up together in Aikido. And I first pair up with her. I didn't know her from anyone. I bow in, the technique is demonstrated. So after that, we, we come together and I said, okay, do you know what he's doing? She looked at me like I had slapped her in the face. She goes, no, I don't know what he did. Do you? And I was like, holy smokes, this girl is rough. You know, that was my, I just, she just didn't know what to do. And that her defense mechanism kicked in. And I was just dumbfounded on, wow, she's not very nice. But of course, later on, we became lifelong friends as a result of that one incident. But when you're, when you're pairing up with another partner, uh, of course, nobody knows what to do. And the first thing we want to do is talk about it. So do you see what he did there? Is this this technique? or whatever. And the next thing you know, you get a lot of little chatter on the mat. And, you know, that's one thing I found. I've trained at lots of different dojos. Before I moved to, before I moved to Maui, uh, I made a point of training at every dojo on the West Coast, some on the East Coast. I didn't care what style. I'm, I did anything, Aikikai, Yoshinkan. Anything I could do to, to go to a dojo, I did it. And I did notice the Aikikai are very good at not talking. They don't talk at all. But on the other hand, the key society dojos, they tend to talk a lot. And I asked, you know, uh, Sayaka about this quite a bit because Sayaka, you know, is from Japan and trained at headquarters. And she said, you know, they don't really talk much at headquarters either. They actually discourage it. You know, so I don't know quite where that talking comes from. I think it's an American thing, but maybe Toby, can you tell me, Toby, is it, is it a European thing too? Chime in. It's, it's also a European thing. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got the, how do you, how do you, for example, solve the, solve the talking issues in your classes? It's difficult. <laughs> we have to, uh, you, you have to actually make people aware of the fact that they are talking too much. Um, and you can't, well, it, I cannot stop everyone from talking uh, in these instances. I have, I myself like to talk a lot, <laughs> even, even during class. Um, it's it's uh, the mixture of having fun and training, and sometimes the balance is off. Right. I think. Right. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And you also have a challenge because in Europe, you've got how many different languages? Yeah, no, many. <laughs> many. Right, so, so I'm saying- Italian, Italian, German, Dutch, yeah. So like, cause I know when, I, when I've been to Europe, 
uh, with the with the uh, you know to Helmand and to Spain and what have you in Germany, I noticed that you know often you know Curtis Sensei has a translator, so therefore he's being translated, and then of course you get the sidebar conversations kind of like at headquarters when there's many different languages of just you know okay this is what he said you know so you also do you have a translator as well uh, no we normally I'll, I'll teach in english but then um, in the last european seminar we had somebody translating in german somebody translating in italian someone translating in spanish and so it's took a lot of time Right, right, right. I can see that. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like tell the secret around a room and then by the time it gets back to you, I no, I wasn't teaching that at all. <laughs> I know Curtis Sensei often comes back from Europe saying, well, I, th I think they understood what I was saying. I I'm not quite sure. <laughs> we'll see next time I go. And that, and that kind of, you know, brings me back to, you know, I don't want to fill all this class with stories, but you know, Suzuki Sensei would he was telling me, you know, in 1953, you know, Toy Sensei comes, nobody knows Aikido, you know, they're getting the deal. Suzuki Sensei's got to learn the 50 techniques to go over everything. And by the time he left, I said, So Sensei, I said, did did everyone everyone completely understand Toy Sensei's teaching when he left? He went, Oh no. By month three, everyone is arguing over what technique and where the foot placement is there and everything. It was mass arguments among, and then everybody had little groups. You know, they had this group over here, they had this group over here, and we have this group over there. Not uncommon nowadays. I mean, I see that happen, you know, where this person, oh, I like how he explains it, or oh, I like how she explains it. And, and the thing of it is, is we have to break our habits. You know, that's just a habit. You know, like any other habit, it's, it's just, you know, just because you like some people and not others, it doesn't mean you should avoid their class. You should go to all the classes, you know, you can make and, and not worry about who's teaching what. Because, you know, trust me, I, uh, you know, my first teacher, Kirk Fowler Sensei, and there was a lot of people from the Eastern Key Federation that wasn't quite there yet, had come over and taught seminars. And I remember, you know, after a seminar, emailing Curtis Sensei, so Sensei, this is what they're doing now. Are they correct? Of course, that's really bad etiquette to do. Don't ever do that. But it, it just reminded me of my habit. You know, I had a habit of liking some people and not others in the dojo and that and, and that tends to branch out into your daily life and you know we have to really be aware you know it's just a matter of noticing <clears throat> so moving on to number 10 number 10 when receiving personal instruction remain quiet until the sensei has completed his or her explanation then bow so I find this is really common in the Aikikai is, you know, and, and this happens a lot where nobody's standing around. You know, when people demonstrate a technique, if they're using a different uke, the two people that are getting demonstrated to are, uh, are sitting stays out looking. If one of the persons being the uke, the other person is sitting stays out looking. And then after the demonstration or any other question left and the teacher leaves, they both bow. Or domo arigato gozaimashita, or whatever. You know, they're always thanking, being appreciative. You know, not interrupting, but you know, they're waiting till the end of the demonstration. You know, they're not talking, and they're bowing at the end. Now, I notice in my intro class that I teach. I teach the beginning class and the advanced class, but I noticed a lot in the introductory class. I get them to do that. They'll do that. They'll they'll sit seiza. They'll bow after they've been. You know, they'll learn because they don't know any different. They're they're learning Aikido for the first time. They're learning this is etiquette. But I guarantee, boom, they go to the advanced class, and then they start picking up the habits of the advanced people. So you have to understand if you're an advanced person at the dojo, people are looking up at you. People are looking, especially if you're wearing a hakama. If you're wearing a hakama, then people are actually going, oh, well, 
they did it, so I'm going to do it that way. Because they, they don't know you or anybody else. They're just trying to do things right. So you have to, you have to realize that any time you step on the mat, somebody is looking up to you. Even if you're just a fourth Q, the fifth Qs are looking up to you. Or people who haven't been ranked, they're looking up to you. So it's, it's just one of those things that you have to understand that you're always being looked at. Maybe not by the teacher, but by other students. So just by practicing simple etiquettes, you know, bowing, you know, uh, when you're when you're wait when you're getting a demonstration, sitting says ah, uh, waiting to be you know taught whatever whatever mistake or whatever question you had, it's that's super super important. Uh, the next one I wanted to cover that you know all of these are linked to talking uh, or interrupting, and this one. Uh, let's see, number 10. Uh, when receiving personal instruction, remain quiet until the sensei has completed his or her and bow. Uh, then number seven was, there should be never be conversation of any kind while the sensei is demonstrating. When training with your partner, speak only as absolutely necessary. And then number 12, which I wanted to talk about, when the sensei is teaching a point, do not attempt to move ahead to another point, thinking you what you know what is next. So, thinking what you know is next. This is this happens a lot. I see this a lot because uh, I like to give instruction, you know, by steps. I I normally don't demonstrate an entire technique, and then have people repeat it, which is what other styles of Aikido do. I tend to like, okay, let's just do this point. And a lot of this, they're thinking, oh, yeah, same side grab, cross hand grab. We're just going to do, oh, I know what he's doing. How many people, have, oh, yeah, I know what he's doing. So, so when, when you're teaching, uh, you may have one point in mind. So as the student, you should be an open book, or as Suzuki Sensei would say, an empty cup. You know, uh, Suzuki Sensei, when he would start every police class, he would read, you know, Suzuki Roshi's verse on empty cup. You know, in the beginner's mind, there are, are, there are infinite possibilities, but in the expert mind, there is a limited possibility. You know, and, and, and when he would read that, he would read that before every police class guaranteed. And another thing he would do as they walked in, you know, he was getting these police recruits and he didn't know their backgrounds. So he would always ask them, he, he would stand at the desk, they'd come in to sign in, they'd sign in, he'd look at their name, look at them and go, have you ever practiced any martial arts? And if they had, he'd write it next to their name. Oh, I practice karate, or I practice judo, or whatever. Some, a lot of none, or I did boxing. And he would make a note. And then when he would he would start the class off, he would talk to the recruits just about his background, the police history, about the levels of respect that police officers receive, and that they should be giving the same respect to everyone in the pub in the public. But then he would go into beginner's mind and he would say, you know, fellas, everyone here is a beginner. I'm a beginner, you're a beginner. Because if you think you're an expert, then there's no possibility. There's no openness. You know, there's nothing more to learn. I, I, was, on a, I was on a call with somebody and I was like saying, hey, you know, you might want to try this. And they said, ah, I'm an expert in that. And I thought to myself, wow expert in that interesting and that and that 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 just meant they have a very closed mind a very narrow mind when it comes to that you know as we grow we tend to get full of a lot of stuff trust me i have a whole closet full of stuff and we have to remember that that is just stuff you know every time you go to class every time you're with your teacher, that is an opportunity. You may not know what that opportunity is, but that's okay. 
And I, I just want to stress that when, when you consider yourself an expert, you know, then you have nothing more to gain. And that would be quite boring that if you knew everything. And, and I just, I, I was always reminded, you know, I have a stack. I don't know. I was looking at him the other day. I have a stack of letters from Suzuki Sensei because I used to write him letters back in the day before internet existed. And he would always write me back. He'd write me back these long letters. And I would always pepper him with these questions because he was, he was the guy. I mean, you know, and he started Aikido in 1953. He was one of the very first Americans to go to Hombu Dojo outside of Terry Dobson. He also, you know, when he moved to Japan in 1971, 72, he, you know, trained with Toy Sensei very, very close. And he knew every, all the Aikikai folks. He was super good friends with Tamura uh, uh, that went to France. And, uh, he was super good friends, you know, with Mariyama, who ended up staying in the Kisa side for a little bit. He, he, he had developed friends because they were all younger than him. You know, Suzuki Sensei was 55 years old. Think about if you decided at the age of 55 to move to Japan and become a, a, a live-in student, so to speak. Tough, you know, tough business. That's very tough because, you know, th that's what the young kids were doing. And that's why, how he knew all the top instructors and that are, you know, went all over the world is because they were in their young 20s. So I would always often ask Sensei questions about the history, you know, what he learned, what so-and-so was like. And if he did not know, I can count oh, many times in the letters, he would just go, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I'd go, but, but, I, th but I thought he knew everything. <laughs> Isn't your teacher supposed to know everything? <laughs> I thought he did, but he didn't. And he would fully admit with no shame, I don't know. That's not important. So, so you have to understand, you know, uh, that kind of thing, you know, uh, not knowing that beginner's mind is something that all of us can benefit from, you know, not just, you know, uh, new students that come in the dojo that have to learn the rules, you know, I'd like to ask Toby, how do you Toby deal with beginning students and learning bad habits? from Udansha in, 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 your, in your dojo and in the, in the European Key Federation? Um, well, difficult question because that's, uh, you have also different connections with people. So sometimes you tell them directly, sometimes you hope it will change because a point might um, reoccur or something might uh, happen again. So it's not always clear in, in, in how to go about that. It's, it's um, uh, yeah, a feeling, give a connection. Us a, give us an example, Toby. How, you, how have you dealt with it in the past, either good or bad? Uh, um, sometimes saying it directly, saying something directly. But that also causes sometimes some uh, friction. Of course. Um, and some... Um, and letting it go sometimes, just allowing the student to make that mistake or, or, or to do it in that way. And it's, it's fine and hope, hoping, not hoping, but knowing that it will be corrected somehow, somewhere along the line. Yeah. Depending on the situation. Situation, yes, tact. Knowing yeah. when to say something and when yeah. to not say something. That's something we learn over time because I've been super direct with people and it hasn't gone quite so well, let's just say. And a lot of people don't like being at the dojo sometimes because I can be rather direct. And, that, and, and then I had to think back. I remember the first time I was direct with somebody, I, it was, a, it was a young lady at, at the dojo in Arizona and she was wearing a necklace and it was a super, super nice necklace. And I realized, hey, etiquette, don't wear jewelry on the mat. The reason why, could get broke, right? So I go up to her and I said, hey, you know, you might wanna take that necklace off. Oh, this necklace is really important to me. Uh, I'm not taking it off. I went, okay. I didn't make her, 
just let it go. Next thing you know, it's broke on the mat. I looked over and said, I told you so. That wasn't quite the right thing to say <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Toby, do you have something to add? Go ahead. I had a, um, a similar situation with a student who was very religious, very religious, and he wore a necklace of, uh, for that, and he couldn't part with it. So we told him, you know, you cannot wear it. And it made a, a, a frustrating for him. So what he did, he made an inside pocket in his gi and put the necklace in, in the inside pocket. Nice. So he could wear it, but not, you know, in plain sight. That is a very good solution. I wish I would have thought of that. It would have saved me some grief with that person. And uh, I don't want to disregard, just talk to Toby, but Olaf, you just popped up right next to him. So Olaf, can you give us some uh, feedback on how you do things? Uh, Olaf has a lot of experience. I know he trained in the IPKI for years and now he's with the Key Society. So, so let us uh, hear from you. Yeah, so my experience is similar to yours, Sensei. I have trained in Aikikai before many years and I noticed uh, when I came to Key Society that there's a lot of talking on the mat. But uh, this also is linked to this, the way we train. So let's say we have key class. Uh, you have to talk to your partner. So now let's do this and now put your mind here and now put your mind to one point. So there is this mandatory talking going on because the partners interact in key class. So, and, and I have the feeling often most key Aikido classes start with key training and then we move on to more Aikido uh, techniques. So this uh, mode of talking to each other is sometimes carried over and never stops. So I think this is kind of a methodology from the, from the method of teaching. It's kind of inherent in the system that yeah. people think uh, talking about what we do is part of our system. Sure. And I, so, have, I have a comment to that effect. I know exactly what you're saying there. And I know um, Sayaka, who, who trained in Japan quite some time with Toy Sensei, she said that, um, you know, and Toy Sensei said this in a lot of his little you know, interviews, he said, you know, when, you know, what made, what made Toy Sensei a great teacher was actually him leaving Japan. Because when he left Japan, that's when students asked, why? Why do we do this, Sensei? Because in Japan, he could teach a technique and the Japanese, due to their style of learning, would do it 10,000 times without asking a question. But here in the West and in Europe, people question, hey, why are we doing this? What, what's the purpose of this? Can you show us something else? And, and I noticed Toy Sensei said that a lot and that really influenced him heavily in, in his instruction on, on why and explaining things. And I know Sayaka would, would say something uh, to the fact that you know, she, she said Toy Sensei would always say, hey, you need to ask me questions. You need to be more outgoing. Don't just trust me. And I think you've even heard Curtis Sensei say this many, many times, is uh, don't just trust what I'm saying. You go out and try it. You experience it. You check it and see if it works. Because he's not just doing this because it's some sort of magical thinking that it's going to happen it's it's you have to put in the work you have to do the training um in order for it to actually you know uh i would say come out of you you know uh uh so i know we do a lot of talking especially during key class just because we are trying to get express 
that, you know, what we're doing and how we're doing things. And this happens a lot when, when an advanced person is paired up with a junior person, the junior person doesn't know anything or maybe they're first class. And of course you as the advanced person, Hey, you can explain things. But that kind of leads into another of the teaching points that I wanted to go over. And that was, uh, let's see, number, ah, number 11. It is inappropriate for a student, including black belts, to offer instruction when he or she is not formally teaching the class or has not been specifically requested to assist by the sensei. This is an essential point of your personal development. It should be followed carefully, particularly among those who assist or teach in other classes. This is new. He, he just put this in here. This, this one is new uh, from the last edition. And, and, and that's because if you've been to headquarters or maybe when you were in uh, Las Vegas, Shinichi Sensei, actually made a point of saying this person is my assistant this person and usually it's the the chief instructors or advanced people and at headquarters he kind of points out the same thing so if you're not one of those appointed don't be teaching you know and and i would always err on the on caution because i have been guilty of over talking and whatever it was. And even though, you know, I would think, well, they, they need help since I, and I'm the beginner teacher, you know, so obviously I should be doing this. But that was just me thinking that. It wasn't, you know, a lot of times Curtis Sensor will say, hey, Trace, can you help them? And I'll do that, that's not a problem, but he's appointed me. But we have to be really super careful because when you establish that kind of habit, then other people think it's okay. Oh, well, so-and-so's doing it. It's okay for me to do it. And, and that kind of goes back to what we said before. Every time you step on the mat, somebody's looking at you, whether it be the teacher, your fellow students, you know, junior students, you know, we, we tend to forget. And it kind of reminds me, you always see these, these, funny things on, on YouTube or where somebody didn't know a camera was there and they get caught doing something or doing something stupid because they didn't think they were being watched. You know, uh, Shaner Sensei always says, you know, lead your life like somebody else is watching you. He often says this at seminars. Uh, Shaner Sensei is uh, the head instructor or the chief instructor of the Eastern Key Federation. And he's come to Hawaii several times and, and, and given instruction. And Charles Boyer, who's with us without his video on, trained under Shainer Sensei quite a bit. So maybe Carlos, can you, uh, can you give us some, some uh, information on, on how you would attack some of these issues and what you learned from Shainer Sensei? Uh -huh. Well, thank you, Sensei, for uh, asking. Well, you know, so I, I agree with you, Arian, on the side of caution is always good in these cases. Um, Shainer Sensei, you know, that dojo uh, the, where I started, it, it has a pretty strong um, adherence to etiquette so uh, i think that helped me uh get some bearings um but i can i can tell you that there was there were times i was a colleague of shaner sensei's at one time uh, we both taught at the same university and so in my early days i would see him in the hallway and I would say, hey, David, how you doing? This is in my early days of training in Aikido. And he never said anything about that. Um, and one time I was on the, on the mat uh, talking uh, 
uh, I forget about what, but I was talking to his wife, who was also one of my teachers at the time, Ileana Shainer Sensei. And, you know, she said, um, this isn't so much about talking, but it was just this kind of etiquette stuff in general. Um, I, I, I happened to mention, you know, I was talking to David and she just stopped and said, oh, we call him Shainer Sensei here. And, you know, and that for me, that was okay. That was it. You know, and that's what I mean by it. They have a pretty strong, clear way of practicing. So I, I feel very fortunate about that. And then about this, um, this specific point that you're talking about right now, um, about assisting the instructor. Um, I've had a, a lot of conversations with uh, Curtis Sensei about this over the years, especially recent years. Um, and yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, all I can do is share what I do based on the things that I've talked to him. He never said, do this, but um, he'll, uh, someone might ask me on the mat, sometimes off the mat, uh, how do you do this? Or what's the, what, what's the rule about this? Or what, do you, what am I supposed to do about this? Or what do you think about racation or whatever? And, you know, Curtis Sensei may be a couple feet away. And so what I've learned over the years, and like, I, like happened with uh, Ileana Shainer Sensei, it wasn't always a, a great learning experience. Sometimes it was like a, a, a slap, right? It was like a shock. Um, what I learned was that um, the, the, the very simple, basic thing I could do was like, oh, let's ask Curtis Sensei. He's right here. Or, he's, I'll, I'll, I'll call him over. And I, I do this off the mat as well, uh, not only on the mat. So I don't know if this helps, but, uh, you know, in terms of my experience, this is kind of like my own, the stages that I've been through, you know, from, from being like, you know, it's, it's like not having a clue what etiquette is and just being kind of chummy and buddy, buddy with people to, to kind of having some, sense of oh i'm being there's a there's a reason for all of this and then at, at this level this 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 number 11 or whatever it is that we're on right now uh is is also kind of okay there's a reason for me to to see this and to to, to deal with this it's in here for me it's there's a purpose for this anyway i i, I hope that that helps. That's been my experience. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Carlos, thanks. It says Charles Boyer, Boyer there, but everybody calls him Carlos, even though it should be Boyer Sensei. He's the head instructor of the Lokahi Dojo, for those of you not from Hawaii. <clears throat> yeah, that's very good. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, you know, uh, teaching teaching on the mat when the instructor is, you know, that's that's one of those pet peeves of Curtis and say that, you know, lately he would call you out on it. And sometimes he doesn't, he'll just kind of say something to the assistant or whoever's assisting myself, or maybe Jeff Baldwin sensei or somebody, you know, it would, it, he would kind of say something, Hey, you know, kind of remind them, you know, and I think that's another good point you, you, you stated, uh, which was, you know, when, you know, uh, Boyer Sensei, uh, he acts as Curtis Sensei's Otomo when he goes to Europe. So he has a lot of one-on-one -on -one experience with Curtis Sensei and share. So he's with him on the mat and off the mat. And that's a really good point of, you know, erring on caution. It, it, and, and some people are super intimidated to approach the Sensei. Super, you know. Uh, it kind of goes back to, I can't remember if 
Curtis Sensei told this story. Oh, I think he told the story at the last seminar about, you know, he was at headquarters, Toy Sensei's off, you know, in the cafeteria there by himself, and nobody will approach him. No one. He's just sitting there because everyone's intimidated to go up and talk to him. And it's kind of like you have to like cross the border to go there <laughs> of all the other people who are kind of defending the area, you know, or, or you might feel like it's kind of stupid to go and talk to him. But, you know, it's really important, you know, if somebody would come up to me or one of, of the other Otomos, I know uh, Fincher Sterling, Axis, Curtis Sensei is Otomo quite a bit and say, hey, what about this? I've overheard Fincher, for example, go, oh, let's ask Sensei. Or, oh, let's ask, uh, you know, he's right over here, let's ask him. Or I, you know, I'm always one of the points of, when we have these parties in Maui, you know, I'm usually sitting, or somebody sitting next to Sensei, I'm always trying to get the new people to come over and sit at the table with Sensei and learn, you know, to, to listen to him talk or, hear him say something just to get a connection with them. Uh, and, and that's, that's really important. You know, when, you know, we, we tend to, sometimes you can get a little bit full of yourself and think, oh, well, actually I can answer that question for you. Of course, you know, Boyer Sensei or, or Fincher could ask, answer those types of questions. They've been training with Sensei quite a bit, but you would, you would deprive that person of an opportunity to connect with Curtis Sensei. And I think that's important uh, uh, to, to mention, you know, anytime, and, and, and that goes back to, you know, if you're teach, when if you, somebody, you're trying to teach somebody on the mat when you're not the teacher, you're depriving that person of a connection with Sensei or an opportunity to learn something maybe you didn't know. And that I think, you know, we tend to don't think of the repercussions of our actions and even how subtle that re repercussion is, it, it could be a big deal. You know, uh, always, if you don't understand something on the mat, raise your hand. Since I don't understand this, what are you going back here? What, what, are you, what are you trying to get at here? And that just gives you an opportunity to experience, you know, what he's trying to get across. I can't tell you the number of times with Suzuki Sensei or Curtis Sensei after class, I would go in the dressing room and help them get dressed. And, you know, they were a little different in their approaches of questioning me. But Suzuki Sensei would go, So, what'd you think? Guaranteed every time that's what he'd ask me. So, what'd you think? And of course, I'd be like, Oh, Sensei, it was great. It was fantastic. You know, it was amazing. And, and of course, Curtis would say, it just depends on what he's either, um, if I'm under the microscope, he's quizzing me about something he taught, but, or he's wanting to know if they really got it. Do you think they understood what I was saying? He says that a lot. Do you think they understood what I was trying to say out there? Of course, what do you say? <sighs> I just try to tell them, hey, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I don't know. I, I kind of get it sometimes, but sometimes you don't always get it, especially not the first, second, third, 50th, 100th time. We don't always get it. It takes, you know, Suzuki Sensei would say, you know, their minds are like a sieve. Everything just leaks through. I just got to keep piling this stuff in there so it won't leak out as much. So you have to, you know, you have to think about those things, you know, when you're trying to be the, be the teacher when you're not the teacher. And, and recognizing that even when, even when you're selected to be one of the guys or gals to point something out to help the sensei, the best thing is refer to the sensei. I mean, you could never lose if you refer to the sensei. Except if you're somebody like Toby Vogel Sensei or or Olaf Schubert Sensei, you you have to not refer to the Sensei because you guys are Senseis. <laughs> and I'll reflect on that a little bit later. But but you have to always understand that there's you have to understand the timing and the tact. So have a few more minutes left. 
maybe we'll stop here because I do have a story to tell. I always got these these interesting stories, or at least I like to think they're interesting. <clears throat> I think this is very relevant of uh, of uh, of where you're at in your training because it's going to mean something. It, it'll probably mean a little different, a little something different for everyone, and. I got it from a good book. If you want the book, I can tell you later. You can email me offline. I can even email you the story if you like it. But here's the story. There's a story of a student who told his teacher that he was going to a far place to meditate so he could become enlightened. So every six months to report the progress he was making, he sent his teacher a note. The first report said, now I understand what it means to lose the self. The teacher tore up the note, threw it in the garbage. Six months later, another report came. Now I have attained the sensitivity to all beings. Again, the teacher tore it up. Then the third report came about six months later. Now I understand the secret of the one and the many and the many. It too was torn up. And so this went on for years until finally, no ports came. So after a time, the teacher became curious. And one day there was a traveler going to that far place. And he said, hey, you know, could you ever, when you get to that place, could you, could you go find that student who told me he was going there to meditate and get enlightened? Can you just track him down and see if he's alive or what's going on? The guy said, yeah, yeah, no problem, I'll do that. About 30 days later, he receives another note from the student. And it merely says, what does it matter? And when the teacher read it, he said, finally, he got it. Good, the teaching will continue. And that's the end of my story. Does anyone have any questions about anything covered tonight? Ah, Alaria? Hello, Sensei. Um, I had a question about the etiquette number number eleven and seven. Um, when you're with the, when you're practicing training with the partner, only speak when necessary. And then in number number eleven about um, never it is inappropriate for a student to offer instruction. Right. I find myself. This is a common scenario. I'll be training with sensei demonstrated a technique. And then I will break up and then I'll train with another student on that technique. Um, and say like, if the other student, if, if, if I'm um, okay, when I'm okay, something about it doesn't feel right to me, maybe I'll like offer a reminder of something based on what Sensei just said that they're doing. Does that count? Is that <laughs> a line? <laughs> like, should yeah. I just work on like myself only and just wait for the sensei to come around or like try to help the person? You could always raise your hand and then the sensei will come over. Or if they're busy, you can just kind of go through the motions or demonstrate yourself. You know, there's many ways to, to, to answer that question. You know, again, it comes down to tact and timing. And, you know, erring on caution is just going through the motions, you know, and, and of course we all, you know, in the middle of a, of a, of a technique, you know, some people say, oh, he's just falling for the person. Well, yeah, of course we all are in a sense. We all know what the other person is going to do. You know, of course we give an honest attack. We do our best to simulate, but you know, when somebody is making a mistake, it just depends. I, I always think if the mistake is not going to hurt me, eh, I just let them make a mistake until we can get the teacher over. You know, it's not going to not going to make a big difference. I'm, I'm not going to make a, a, an aha moment so much with one little mistake that they're making. You know, uh, I would say, you know, always err on the caution. You can always call the instructor over. But, you know, just think about not 
you're in it for your experience, but you have to understand that when this, you have this deeper connection with your teacher and with other students, that it's all one thing happening. And you don't want to be the, the person that deprives another person. You, you don't want to do no harm as a, a, as a point. So if you just think of it as, is this going to harm somebody or not? It's going to harm me with the technique. It's dangerous. Yeah, I'm going to stop it. If not, let's just go on. It's no big deal. Does that answer your question? I think so. Thank you. So okay. We have time for like one more question. If not, Fincher, you always have good questions. If there's no other questions, that's great. I was that clear. So just a reminder, next, let's see, uh, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, we'll have class again. And, you know, don't, uh, don't, um, letting go, peruse it. You might find some good questions in there for Friday's class or on Wednesday's class, you might just ask a question and always be prepared with a question because you never know when the instructor is going to call on you or comment. So anyway, thank you so much. Domo arigato gozaimashita. Arigato gozaimashita. We'll leave the meeting. Thanks a lot, guys.